assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Are you going to sing with us? Yeah, I'll sing with cool. you. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I know this one. Okay, now it says make a joyful noise. So I don't care if you can't sing, at least make a joyful noise. Okay? <laughs> All right. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture, numbers from my sight. Angels descending, bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Raising my sin. Father in heaven, we're grateful that you'll take our hand tonight and lead us home. Because, Father, we're all longing to be with you. We know Jesus went to prepare a place for us, and he's coming back to take us home. Prepare our hearts tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Good to see you all tonight. Uh, welcome this evening, Pastor Tom Dodge, uh, pastor here at Fremont, as well as Livermore Churches. I see some visitors here tonight, Jack. Good. If this is your first night in the meetings, let me see your hands. Look at that, Jack. Four. Good. Very, very good. And... Uh, Jack, I think they heard about Revelation last night, and they came to heed, mm -hmm. and they came to listen, and they came to read. So if they do that, what do they get, Jack? A blessing. Yes. Isn't that what it said? Okay. Uh, but you know, Jack, each night, uh, Jack not only likes to preach to you, he likes to give things away. Jack, you're very generous. Oh, thank you. Because, you know, I think it's Tuesday night, uh, Monday night when we come back, because we won't be here tomorrow night. Right. I'm going to wear that tie that you gave me. Okay. Jack gave me a tie, and wait till you see it. <laughs> uh, very good. It's like his ties, you can see. Very nice with the pandas on. But, uh, Jack, tonight, don't we have a quiz? So, for those of you who did the... Uh, um, Workbooks that Jack gave you each night, he will give you uh, a set uh, for, to do homework because that's part of what Revelation says. You take it home and uh, you read and uh, something about that. Jack brought that out last night. There's something about reading. There's something about hearing the word and there's something about taking it to heart. So when you go home, you're taking it to heart. And um, it looks like we're ready. Which fulfilled prophecies confirm the Bible's inspiration? There it is. Cyrus would capture Babylon, Isaiah 45. Okay. So the first one was Cyrus would defeat Babylon. For those of you who keep the track, Cyrus would defeat Babylon, number one. Egypt would never again be a strong leading nation. Okay, does Ezekiel fulfill or uh, predict that? The next one, moral degeneracy. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Uh, moral degeneracy for men would be lovers of themselves, without self-control, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Okay, are you still with me? That was all on number one. Number two, how did Jesus show his belief in, Bi in the Bible's inspiration? Remember uh, the quote from uh, Luke 24, 26, and 27? M beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them in all the scripture the things concerning himself. So you will be uh, filling in scripture. <clears throat> Number three, what scientific facts does the Bible mention? To establish a weight for the wind, air has weight, okay? In case you thought air weighs nothing, air has weight, okay? Did you get that? All right. Uh, the earth is round. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, okay? The Bible did not say that the earth was flat, okay? It says it was round, okay? Thank you. That's right. Um, yeah, he sits on the circle of the earth. Uh, name the health rule that appears in the Bible, number four. Leave alcoholic beverages alone. Those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine. He says what? They're not wise. Okay? Number five, who is the real author, the real Bible author? The real Bible author is the Holy Spirit, because it says, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Okay, you still with me? You still doing well? Still getting them all right? Okay, Kwong, we're going to number six now. Name some of the Bible predictions about the Messiah's life. 
He was sold for 30 pieces of silver, and it says in Zechariah 11:12, so they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord, okay? Fulfillment, as it says here, Matthew 26, 14 to 16. Um, and King Herod would try to kill him. It says, Rachel weeping for her children because they are no more. That was predicted in Jeremiah 31, 15 and fulfilled in Matthew 2, 13 to 18. It says that Jesus would be crucified. They will look on him, of me, whom they've pierced. Zechariah 12, 10, and it was fulfilled in John 19, 16 to 18. Still doing well? Okay. Number seven. Am I going too fast? You keeping up? Okay. How should we test all religious teaching and doctrines? Remember, there is a test. The test is Acts 17.11, which says they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So you should be writing searched in the blank there. The next one is Isaiah 8.20, to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you should have testimony and no light. Number eight. According to Jesus, where do we find the truth? All right. Jesus said what? I am the way the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. What else? Thy word is truth. So write in word. And Psalm 119, your law is truth. So Jesus is the truth, the word is truth, and the law is truth. Still doing well? What happened when Jesus explained the scriptures to his two discouraged disciples on the road to Emmaus? It said, did not our hearts burn? You should have written in there within us while, we t while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scripture. Number 10. Do you wish to fully understand Scripture? If your answer is yes, please open the door to your heart to all my words. Now I have to ask, did anyone get them all right? How many? Show up your hands high. No, close. One, two, three, four, five, six. Jack, bring the books. So how many of you read chapter four, five, six, and seven? Did you home and read it? Good. All right. Tonight, that's what we're going to talk about is Revelation four, five, six, and seven. Let's just take a minute and ask God to guide our study. Father, here we are. We want to learn. So would you please inspire us as you inspired John, that we might be able to understand what we are studying. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I had one person tonight ask me about how we covered the church history, if she could get a copy of that. I said yes, but tonight we're going to be also studying social history. We're, Revelation is giving us three anchors that we can know where we are. Now, the other anchor is military history, and that's going to be next Tuesday night. 
So on Tuesday night, you're going to get a slip of paper that has church history and all the dates, social history and all the dates, and military history and all the dates. Okay? But I'll give it to you next Tuesday. <clears throat> It was a cold morning in New York. And the young boy came up to the policeman and said, Sir, where will I sleep tonight? And he said, Well, I guess you'll sleep where you slept last night. He said, Oh, no, sir, it was too cold. He said, Where did you sleep? He said, Over there underneath those stairs. He said, Don't you have a home? And he said, No. He said, all right, son, I want you to go down to the end of the block, and I want you to turn right. <clears throat> I want you to go three blocks and turn right again. And then on the right-hand side of the street, you're going to come to a great big house. You won't miss it. And when you get there, I want you to walk up and knock on the front door. <clears throat> Now, when somebody says, who's there, I don't want you to give them your name. I want you to say, John 3.16. He said, oh, okay. So down to the corner, turned right. Three blocks down, turned right again. Thank you. And then there in the middle of the street on the right-hand side, there was that great big house. You just couldn't miss it. He walked up to the front doors and knocked on the doors. Pretty soon somebody said, who's there? And the little boy said, uh, uh, John, John 316. And the door opened and a distinguishing gentleman invited him to come in. Took him in and said, wait here. And there was a nice big fire going, so he was standing over there, you know, just warming himself. And, and he was saying, you know, John 3.16, I don't even understand what that's all about, but I know one thing, it can sure make a cold boy warm. Pretty soon the man came and said, follow me. So up the stairs he went into this big bathroom, and there was a great big tub full of nice hot water. And the boy said, for me? And he said, yes. And the boy tore off his clothes and did a swan dive into the tub. And man, is he enjoying this. And he says, John 316, what in the world is that all about? I don't understand it, but it can sure make a dirty boy clean. Pretty soon the man came, knocked on the bathroom door, and he said, are you done? He said, yes. And so he handed him some clothes, and he put on the clothes. When he was dressed, he said, follow me. He took him back downstairs to the dining room. And in the dining room, there was a great big table, and at one end of it, there was all kinds of food. The little boy sat down there and began to eat, and he ate, and he ate, and he ate, until he just couldn't eat anymore. And he was sitting there rubbing his stomach, and he said, John 3.16, it can sure make a hungry boy full. Pretty soon the man come, said, are you finished? He said, yes, follow me. Back upstairs they went and down this long hall to a bedroom opened the door, and he said, this is where you'll sleep tonight. He said, for me? He said, yes. And so the little boy went over and jumped onto the bed. It was a nice, downy, soft bed. As he sunk down into the bed, he said, wow, I don't know what this John 3.16 means, but he says, I can tell you this, it can sure give a tired boy rest. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Do we have to fear the things we're learning in the book of Revelation? No. Why? If you have accepted Jesus, it's there for your information so that you're not taken by surprise it's there for you to understand how near his coming is, but it's not there to scare you. We're going to read over in Revelation, it says the scared ain't going to heaven anyway, okay? So you can't be scared into heaven 
It's that simple. You've got to be there because you want to. As we open the Bible, we begin in chapter 4 and verse 1. After these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven and one set on the throne. And he who sat there was like Jasper and sat a stone. And in appearance, there was a rainbow around the throne in the appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 elders. On the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes and their crowns. They had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne proceeding lightning and thunders and a voice, seven lampstands of fire were burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne, around the throne, there were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. And the second living creature was like a calf. And the third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures each had six wings and were full of eyes round and within. And they do not rest day or night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sat on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders would fall down and worship him who sits upon the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then a strong angel I saw proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and loose the seals? There was no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept all oh, much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or even to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose the seven seals. I looked and behold, and in the midst of the throne of the four creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out unto all the earth. And then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down and worshiped for before the lamb, each having harps and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll. And to open its seals, you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. I then looked, and I heard voices of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them were 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain 
to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Every creature which is in heaven on earth and under the earth, such as are in the seas and all them, I heard saying, blessings and honor and glory and power to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Now I saw the lamb open one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked and behold a, a white horse and he that sat upon it had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living beast say, Come and see. And another horse that was fiery red went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, that the people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat upon him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not hurt or harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come and see. And I looked, and I behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death. And Hades, or hell, followed it with him. Power was given to them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, by beast of the earth. Did you notice this is the only horse that actually has a name? The writer actually has a name. What's his name? death. And Hades, or hell, means the grave, followed after him. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord? holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then white robes were given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was complete. What we're looking at tonight is social history. That's what we're looking at. As we find this, we're going to see how this fits together and how it comes together with church history. In the very first century, the truth of God, what does white stand for? Truth, amen? Light, righteousness. The truth of God spread throughout the land. The horse equals riders and angels. White is purity. The crown is victory. And the bow is success against evil. As we find, this was during the first century. Christianity spread like wildfire. White horse and the red horse. Now, the red horse is between the second, third, and the first part of the fourth century. Red by the blood of those of the Christians. It represents red equals bloody persecution, and the sword is a symbol of bloodshed. So the horse that was white changed to red by the blood of those that it slayed. Now we go on to the dark horse. 
Black equals darkness or false. Weighing famine for truth, oil, the Holy Spirit, and wine, the atoning blood of Jesus. This is the fourth, fifth, and the first part of the sixth century, and we know it in our history books. It's called the Dark Ages, came in A.D. 1229. The white horse of truth had been supplanted to where now it was black without the truth. As we find this, how did it happen? Constantine was killing Christians by the thousands. And he even made a comment, he says, every time I kill one, it's like their blood is fertilizer and I get 10 more. He said, I guess if I can't beat them, I might as well join them. He supposedly reported he'd seen a vision and there was a golden cross in the sky and it said, by this emblem, you will conquer. So he professed Christianity. The first thing he did when he became bishop of all bishops, he made a law everybody had to worship on the variable day of the sun in the year 321. Okay? In 337, worship of the saints. Now, this is worship of the dead. You understand what it means? The rosary came in in the A.D. 366. Now, you look in almost any pagan religion, and they have what they call prayer beads. Okay? And as you're doing your chants or your meditation, you're supposed to do one at a time and make sure that you keep track how many you've done. That's what it's for. This was brought in to the house of God. The first mass in the year 394. What's the difference between mass and communion? In mass, supposedly, the priest has the power to change the wafer into the actual body of Christ. And the wine, he has the power to literally change the wine into blood. Now, what did Jesus say about the bread? Was it really his body? It represented his body, didn't it? And when he talked about drinking the wine or the grape juice, was it really his blood? No, it represented his blood. Are you with me? What's the significance, folks? Well, there was two things. Number one, they started saying mass for money. Number two, do you realize that if they truly change the wafer into the body and the wine into blood, they're re-crucifying Jesus. You understand that? In the year 538, the papacy became the supreme authority. Up until then, there was really church and state. Now it became one. As we move on, purgatory came, purgatory came in in the year 590. Y'all know what purgatory is? See, the Bible tells us there's a heaven and a hell. Well, they came up with an idea to make money. Now, what do I mean? They wanted to build St. Peter's Basilica, but they didn't have any money to do it. So they came up with this teaching of purgatory. And here's basically what it was saying. If your loved one who'd passed away, if you will pay money, we'll pray them out of there. The money poured in, folks. Is it a teaching from the Bible? No, it is not. Holy water came in in the year 682. Do you know why holy water came in? Up until then, did you realize that the church baptized by immersion? The problem is, 
Some of the priests didn't like the idea, so they decided to be able to come up with holy water, and if you were sprinkled with it, it was baptism. I was up in Price, Utah, and I went to a pastor's meeting of the whole town from all different religions. All the pastor was there, with the exception of the Catholic priest. He was out of town on vacation. And after they had had a worship service, they were sitting around and discussing, and they were having refreshments, all different things. And I don't know how it came up, but one of the pastors said, how in the world do you get holy water? Now, the Lutheran pastor looked at him and said, you don't know how to get holy water? They said, no, how do you get holy water? He said, it's simple. You fill up a pan from the tap, put it on the stove, and boil the hell out of it. Now, I'm not sure the Catholic priest would have enjoyed that, but all the preachers in the room laughed about it. Folks, <laughs> only God can make something holy. Amen? But from that, po that point on, they came up with sprinkling, or the priest would baptize a baby, and this is where it began and came from. Then the mass was said for money in 799. Saints were canonized. That was making a saint a sort of a god, and you could pray to him. Then there were wakes came in for the dead in the year 1079. And then in the year 1229, the Bible was absolutely forbidden. If you had one, you could die because you had it. It's that simple. That's why it's called the Dark Ages. If you don't have this, you don't have light. Dark Ages, are you with me? And as we see, this is when the pale horse began to ride. And as we find that the pale horse was riding, it says it equals death, grave, destruction of God's people. Now, credible historians report that in the second half of the 6th century, through the 15th century, more than 50 million people lost their lives because they wouldn't renounce their faith or give up their Bible. Exactly as it said. Many of these people were classified and branded as heretics. Souls crying out represents like Abel's blood cries out. White robe was the victory through Jesus. They would rest a season or wait in the graves for Jesus. They were saints, and he clothed them in white robes. They weren't heretics at all. Am I making this plain so far as you're going through it? If we go back to the scriptures now, we discover that we move in to the next one. When he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky recedes as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Wow. As we find and we look at this, we discover something. According to our own history books, the year 1755 was the largest earthquake ever registered at that time. It was felt in many places around the world. It was reported that they knew over 60,000 people died in that earthquake. In Connecticut's historical collection, the 19th of May, 1780, was a remarkable day. The legislature was in session at Hartford, Connecticut. And when they asked the opinion of Colonel Davenport, should they adjourn, he answered, I'm against adjournment. The day of judgment is either upon us or it is not. 
If it is not, there is no need to adjourn. And if it is, I choose to be found doing my duty. In Stone's history of Beverly, Massachusetts, at or about midnight, the unusual darkness lifted and the moon appeared as red as blood. In Noah Webster's Dictionary of the English Language, he said, about the dark day and the red moon, this true cause of this remarkable phenomenon is unknown. We move forward in history up to 1833. Stars fell. In the American Journal of Science of Art, it says the morning of November the 13th, 1833, was remembered as remarkable by the falling of the phenomenon called the shooting star. In the Manual of Astronomy, it says November the 13th, 1883, the stars fell at a rate of more than two million or more per hour for more than six hours. Did it just happen on the East Coast? Folks, how many, anybody here from Alabama? Any ever been to Alabama? Have you noticed their license plate? They call themselves the state of the falling star, referring back to this date. This wasn't one little central location, folks. It was all over. And we find this as an amazing thing. And God predicted it and said it would happen. So right now, we have been taken up right to the year 1833, from the first century. What is going to happen next? As we turn back to the scriptures, we discover, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the commanders, and the mighty men, every slave and free man hid themselves in the rocks and in the mountains, and said to the rocks and mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. What is happening? The king is coming. Can you imagine being afraid of a lamb? How many have ever been around the lamb? Is it anything to scare you? But here it says they're afraid of the wrath of the lamb. Who's the lamb? Jesus is the lamb. And they're calling, hide us from the face of him. These are ones who are left behind. Does it talk about a second chance at this point? We'll get there, don't worry. As we see in verse 17, the great day of his wrath has come. Who shall be able to stand? Well, those of us who have given our life to Jesus, we don't have to worry. Amen. We're going to be looking up and saying, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. That's what we will be doing. What a wonderful time to find our Savior coming in the clouds of glory as he's promised he would. How far away is it? Not very far. I'll prove it to you when we get on in Revelation. Like I told you, symbolically now, Jesus said we can know it's near even at the door. I'm going to have Jesus pull up in your driveway get out of the car, and head for the front door. You want to know how near it is? Don't miss a class. This class is so vital, important for us today. It was written for us today. You understand that? This way we can take courage in what we believe because what was predicted came true just as God said it would. And if all that came true, is the balance going to come true? We know it. We have an anchor that will not fail. As we move in to the next chapter, in verse 7, chapter 7, these things I saw, 
And four angels were standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having a seal of the living God, and he cried out, Hurt not the earth or the sea. Do not harm it until we have sealed our servants of God in our foreheads or in their foreheads. And as he told this, they were saying the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And then it goes on to list each one of those tribes. Can somebody tell me which tribe is missing? The tribe of Dan isn't there. What name is put in in Dan's place? You're looking at the Bible. Tell me, what name was put in in Dan's place? Manassas. And who was Manassas? Joseph's son. Are you with me? Now, as we look at these things, I want to tell you something. There is a hidden message here. And if you don't understand it, you're missing a very large blessing. Rachel and Leah, whenever they had a child, a son born, and there were 12 Jacob's sons and one grandson listed. And here's the blessing that the mothers said. Judah, I will praise the Lord. And please note, they're not listed in the order they were born. Reuben, he has looked on me. Gad, granted good fortune. Asher, happy am I. And Nepali, my wrestling. Manassas, making me to forget. This was the grandson. Simeon, God hears me. Levi, join to me. Issachar, purchase me. Zebulun, dwelling. Joseph, God will add to me. And Benjamin, the son of my right hand. What is the message that God has in his word in this listing of the 144,000? Well, I want to read it to you. Now, I have taken the liberty of adding an and or uh, 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 you know, an if or a will. Are you with me? And it's in italics that you can see I've added. What is the message? I will praise the Lord, for he has looked on me and granted me good fortune. Happy am I because my wrestling God is making me to forget. God hears me and is joined to me. He has purchased me a dwelling. God will add to me the son of his right hand. That's the hidden message in the book of Revelation about the 144,000. This message, folks, it tells of the, describes the story of the church, the struggle and the redemption and the victory and the marriage to the Lamb. That's what it describes and shows us exactly what had happened and what was going on when it happened. Now the big question, are the 144,000 literal? We got people arguing over everything. Are you with me? Listen, I'm gonna tell you something. We were told by a lady that I believe uh, received some insight, and she says, we should not be dogmatic over the 144,000, okay? And we have some that, you know, literally take to uh, uh, heart that we should be striving to become one of the 144,000. Most of them I don't like to be around very much because they're anything but happy Christians. I had one man that he was always harping at me at camp meetings about one of the 144,000. We need to strive to be one of the 144,000. And I looked at him and I said, well, you ought to stop because you ain't going to make it. And I mean, it was like I had poured a, a bucket of cold water on him. You know what I'm saying? What do you mean by that? 
I said, well, the Bible says, as a matter of fact, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all unto myself. I haven't heard you once tell anybody about Jesus. All you can ever talk about is being one of the 144,000 and what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. But I said, I've never heard you say we should be lifting up Jesus Christ. And until you make that your number one thing, I'll just tell you in advance, quit trying because you ain't going to make it. It's a fact, folks. I can tell you the 144,000, we're going to see it. Their sole purpose is to lift up Jesus Christ. That's what their whole purpose is about. And listen, who gets to be one of the 144,000? That's not up to us. That's up to God. Are you with me? As we look at this, are the other numbers in Revelation literal? In other words, will there actually be 12 gates in the city, 12 foundations? 12 different kinds of fruit on the tree of life. Our understanding of the size of the new Jerusalem is based on the assumption these are real numbers. By the way, it's about the size of the state of Oregon. Can you imagine that? But don't forget this. It's also 375 miles that way. Now that's a skyscraper. You know, I love that old Negro spiritual. I heard it when I was down south. There's plenty good room in my father's house. <laughs> Somebody just decided to pick a number, and they said, if your mansion in heaven is 40,000 square feet. Now, can you imagine girls trying to clean 40,000 square feet? There is enough room in the city, folks, for in excess of four mil billion people. Plenty good room in my father's house. And I can tell you if he needs more, he'll build it faster than you can imagine. Amen? Amen. Folks, what a wonderful thing. Even prophetic numbers for prophetic times are precise measurements. God predicted it, said when it would happen, and it did. So as we look at this, why 12? 12 in the Bible is very significant. I don't know if you realize this. There are 12 stones in Aaron's breastplate. There are 12 foundations in the New Jerusalem. It has 12 gates. And in Revelation 12, it describes the woman, church, with 12 stars in her crown. The King David appointed 24 groups of 12 to lead the praise music in the temple. Man, I can't wait to hear that one. And by the way, go read Psalms 150. You may change your idea of what it's going to be like, okay? <laughs> there are 24 elders, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. By the way, they were literal. There are 12 judges from Othniel to Samuel. There are tw in the prophets, there were 12 from Seth to Noah, 12 from Shem to Jacob. I believe the 144,000 are a precise figure. Imagine what heaven is telling us. In the center is God. The four creatures surround him. Then there are 24 elders, six on each side. Then the 144,000, 36,000 on each side. The perfect order of harmony of this assembly is astounding. As we look at this, let's take a look at the mission. In Jesus' day at his first coming, the apostles were literal Jews. They worked at the time of Jesus' first coming. The numbers were complete. When all were converted, they had the former reign, the first fruits of the first coming. 
thousands were converted in a day and had Jesus' name. There was no guile in their mouth. They followed Jesus and worked before the great persecution in Jerusalem. They sang with Jesus, not defiled by the leaven of the Pharisees, set on 12 thrones judging and led loudly proclaiming Jesus king with palms. Now let's look at the 144,000. They are spiritual Jews, not physical Jews. Are you hearing me? If you have accepted Jesus Christ, you have become an heir of Abraham. That means you became a blood brother to Jesus, who, by the way, Jesus was a Jew. Hello? Are you with me? They work at the time of Jesus' second coming. The number is complete when sealed with the latter reign. The first fruits of the second coming. There is a great multitude converted. I believe we're going to see thousands upon thousands converted in a day, folks. There will be many who take their stand for Jesus. The great multitudes converted, they have the Father's name. They have no guile. They follow the Lamb. They work before the great persecution in the world. Sing a song with the Lamb. They are not defiled with the doctrines of Babylon. They sit on 144,000 thrones judging. Leads loudly proclaiming Jesus their King with palms. Do you see any similarity? I believe most of them will be lay people. The 12 apostles were lay people. I believe the 144,000 will be mostly lay people. I want to show you Mission Impossible. In AD 34, there were 12 apostles. To reach the world. Did you know the world's population in their day was 200 million? Hello? Were they successful? Even Paul says the gospel has gone to all of the world, at least the known world they knew about. Now let's jump all the way down to the year 2017. There is almost 7 billion people. 144,000? That's kind of mission impossible, isn't it? If you actually look at it, the percentages are about the same. No accident. God doesn't do anything by accident. Now, some people lose heart and say, well, I know I won't be one of the 144,000. So what? The Bible says, I looked, and there was a great multitude, a number of which no man could be able to number. And they were the ones more than take the place of those that were shaken out. If you're one of the 140,000, praise God, you got a lot of work to do. That's God's choice. Our choice is to be in the great multitude. And what do we have to do except Jesus is our personal Savior? And I don't care whether I'm outside the 36 that sits around or I'm one of the 36. I don't care. I just want to be there. Amen? Isn't that what you want? Don't get zoned in on that. This is God's prophecy, and God will fulfill it the way he thinks it ought to be fulfilled. As we move on, in verse 9 it says, These things, after these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, all the nations of the tribes of people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palms, branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. 
and all the angels surround the throne and the elders and the four living creatures all fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessings and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. And John adds, Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these that are arrayed in the white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell with them. Wow. Therefore they belong to God and serve him. They shall neither hunger anymore, thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor the heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to a living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, and they follow me. I just want to touch on chapter 8. We're not going to cover it until Monday. But it says in chapter 8, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. Why? Is there silence in heaven? We're going to find out on Monday night. Now, don't come tomorrow night. You'll be here by yourself. And if I give you a day off, please don't forget to come back on Monday night. Okay? Same time, same place. And we're going to be going right on from here. So read on in chapter 8. Now let's sing our closing song. Those that were here for church, some people may think that we're wearing this song out. But as far as I'm concerned, it fits right here, and we ought to know it. We have this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lamb. Shall we stand together as we sing this song? showing us more history tonight and showing us that all things are in your control. Father, whether you select one of us or more of us to be 144,000, may thy will be done. But my prayer tonight, Father, for everyone in this room, they will accept Jesus and what he did for us and be clothed in his robe of righteousness that we might be able to stand before the throne even though there may be a number nobody can number. We want to be there, Father. Keep what we've committed to you this night against this day that we might look up and say, this is our God. He will save us. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Amen. Good night, everyone. God bless you. And don't forget your homework on the way out. Lesson two.